Dinosaur Joint on ETH and the SEC here. And um, welcome to the FCL Global Seminars. My name is Miranda and organizing this global seminar with Jin Ya and Jin Wang. And before I introduce our speaker today, I would like to mention a couple of house rules. So the format totally is around one hour and 30 minutes for the presentation and 30 minutes for discussion and Q&A. And during the Q&A, please feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the questions. Please note as the microphone is not on the ceiling here. So please ask the questions loudly and the audience from Zurich can use Zoom chat and write questions in the chat box via the Zoom link. And please kindly keep yourself muted for the presentation part. And, and today's global seminar is on the eco revolution, unleashing the future of sustainable construction materials. And welcome, um, uh, welcome our two speakers, on um, Ali Reza and on um, Reza. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, so I think, uh, as you mentioned, what we want to do, present today is some of the work that we have been doing on the part of the future cities lab from FCL1, FCL2, and then a little bit of work on FCL2 local computing, and also some of our research that we have been doing at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. So it's a collaboration, of course, we have a lot of collaboration between us and then STC and then NTU and ETH Zurich. So we just want to showcase some of the research that we have been doing over the past uh, couple of years. So we always start basically with the problem, with the, what we call uh, the problems that we have. The always we start with the problems. And normally one of the major problems that we would like to address, especially for us as architects and engineers, as one of planners, the problem with the population. If you look at this map, this is how the population looks like in the 1950s. The number of the small cities, the number of medium cities, or even mega cities, you can see they're very small. More than 70% of the people were living in villages. But of course, if you look at the map in 2013, just few years from now, you will see that we will have only 40% living in the rural areas, and more than I would say 20, if you compare 60%, we live in the urban areas. And that means that for the, not only for us as engineers, the designers, the planners, but also for the government agencies. That's the question of how we want to build the cities and how we want to build the cities, how we want to uh, prepare or bring infrastructure for the people. And that's the question for us in our research is that how we can house all this population in the next years to come in the city. So we need not only food, but what we need is a basic necessity of the city, and that's the housing and the infrastructure. For housing and infrastructure, of course, we always need materials. Materials being dominant by the synthetic materials, mining the planet, mining the earth, for the minerals, for the metals, and that trend keeps increasing and increasing. But the resources that we have is rather finite. So we have a problem with resources scarcity. We have a problem with synthetic materials, the emissions from the production of those synthetic materials. And at the same time, if we look at how we consume materials, for example, if you look at this, uh, take time because I think it's a little bit on the resolution side. So if you look at, for example, Austria, the way that the Australians consume the materials, consume the raw materials, means that we need four times of Earth's available resources. So it means if we consume the way that we consume like Australians, the Earth is not enough because we need four times of the Earth. So then the question rises that, yeah, so this one also you can see. Uh, the question rises that how much resources are already available, for example. For example, I mean, maybe you can see on the last one on the zinc. This is a reserve to product ratio. It means that how much zinc resources we have and how much reserve we have until it finishes. So it shows also other metals like iron ore, unfortunately, we don't see. But if you look at the reserve to production ratio, 
You can see, for example, for iron ore, which we produce a lot of our cars, we produce a lot of our uh, steel for construction, for furniture, for cars. We only have 120 years. I mean, since 2005. This is the research done in Germany in 2005. Means that the resources are not enough. We have finite resources, then we have to think about alternative, uh, basically, resources. To address the major challenges that basically face, especially by the fields in one, the challenge of the deforestation, because we cut a lot of trees to decrease the demand for timber based products. The waste that generated by the industry that normally not being recycled, only 10% of the waste being generated is being recycled by the built environment only. And that did, of course, with a lot of carbon emissions. So I don't know what the business I have to <laughs> So there's a point, there's a process. Okay, what are the alternatives? Let me know in your next time. Maybe you can see from your laptop. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, yeah. So we have to look what are the alternatives. Therefore, in our research, we started to focus on three major research elements. First one is the regenerative and bio based materials. The resource efficiency in design, especially for us as architects, as engineers, and the circularity in construction, how we can bring circularity and modularity in construction. The first research that I would like to uh, address is the regenerative and bio based uh, materials. The very first research that basically we started was what, looking into natural fiber. So, one of the most uh, interesting factors about the natural fibers is that we have more than 100, 120 different types of natural fibers. So the question for us that time in 2012, when we started the research at FCM, was what type of natural fibers are we interested in? We were based in Singapore, and we were looking into surrounding countries and the regions, and for us, bamboo was something that very interesting to explore. So bamboo, as you know, it grows very, very fast and is available almost all over the continents in Asia, Africa, Latin Central America. And most importantly, bamboo grows very fast. So if you compare it to timber-based products, you can see bamboo grows less than four or five years. But if we talk about timber-based uh, trees, for example, some of the most uh, prominent ones like tea, we need only at least 70 years. So means that in terms of renewability, in terms of resource scarcity, bamboo in that time that we were started looking into would have answered the question. But of course, for us as engineers, also for us, what's important to know that it has mechanical properties. If you compare the mechanical properties of bamboo even to some of the synthetic fibers like carbon or glass, it was almost equivalent. Therefore, we started to set up the lab in Singapore. We got this funding from. FCL1, basically National Research Foundation, 2011. Then we set up the lab in 2008, 2012, 2013, actually at Innovation Wing Level 1. And we started to explore how we can produce materials out of bamboo that are not just composites, but also industrially wired. So if you go to AGI, if you go to, for example, Indonesia, you see a lot of nice resources, nice hotels made out of bamboo. But for us, that was not a question because the problem with those elements is that they are natural. After a while, they get degraded. So in terms of environmental and weathering conditions, they were not so good. So we had to develop some materials that industrially they are viable. So something that could compete with concrete, with the steel, with engineer timber products. Therefore, we started to explore various methods of how to explore extractive bamboo fibers, and how to make the binders more sustainable. So we started to collaborate with some uh, German and Swiss polymer companies. We started to explore. We focused on extract, fiber extraction in our lab. The companies helped us with the development of sustainable binder solution. And that's where basically we developed these uh, composite materials out of bamboo. Basically what we had here was 90% bamboo fibers that we managed to develop the technique to extract it without damaging the fibers. And we manage also to patent it in several countries, several regions. And in terms of properties, we started to test it for various properties, mechanical properties, like tensile, like bending, to see how good it is to be applied in the construction or some other industries. Uh, so these are some of the properties. I don't want to go through the whole detail, 
But if you're familiar with the term like flexural strength, how good is the material to break it in bending? So we could have we could have achieved almost like 180 at the minimum level, which when we compared it to the steel grade, quite not exactly the same, but quite close. But when we compared it to concrete or when we compare it to timber, it's almost like five to six times higher. And that shows that the technique that the team developed was quite uh, prominent in terms of extracting the bank fiber, in terms of putting it together with the binder comp composite fabrication. So it had the opportunity to be applied somewhere. Therefore, we started to explore different applications. The first application we did was to see how we can replace the steel reinforcement in concrete. Normally, in concrete construction, we have a steel as a reinforcement system. Here, we thought that based on the strengths that we have, why not for low cost, low rise housing, we explore BVL, our bamboo in the longer technology. So, we tested various components of it here at the FCF and also at ETH in Zurich. And what we have achieved at the end of this project, the first project was that it was possible to replace it, but in terms of some other properties like plastic modulus or what we call it uh, compatibility with concrete, we had to do some improvement, which are the research that we are currently doing at uh, KIT with some other research institute uh, in Germany. But in terms of the next application, we started to look into the material itself. So we saw that the BVL, has quite amazing properties. Why not to, to use, why not use it on its own as a standalone material, replacing the whole country, replacing the whole steel element because it has quite good uh, mechanical capacities to be a structural. It, therefore, we developed hollow sections to improve the, the stiffness, to improve the elastic modulus, to improve the mechanical capacities. And then this was the time that basically we started to showcase it in different projects and to show that how light it is. So when we compared it to the uh, steel or even concrete in terms of weight to strength ratio was almost five six times higher and that means less materials for similar amount of the strengths but of course more sustainable sources. therefore another project that we did is rich so you know in europe we don't have much value so the idea was that how we can translate the research that being done in singapore for our partners in Zurich, in, in europe generally the research normally we do research in europe in the west and then we transform it into the east, but this time we wanted to be on the other direction. So we started to collaborate with some uh, wood in basic engineers with capacity or with expertise in wood. And the idea was that normally in timber construction, we always use glass fibers or carbon fibers to reinforce timber to make it stronger. So here we started to explore the idea of reinforcing the timber elements with our BBM. So like that, we don't need them. Huge amount of BPF. We need very thin layers so in terms of life cycle assessment and carbon emissions. And considering the transport, we would be still uh, managed to have uh, basically compete with even steel and concrete. And also, when we started to look into the strengths, we would be able to improve the mechanical capacity of the beam even with, uh, with the timber with BPF almost 20%. So we would have achieved. More strength also, we would have achieved more sustainability compared to uh, steel and concrete. And different applications. So, we had a lot of students during that uh, three, four years' time in Singapore. We worked a lot with NUS, NTU, Republic Poly students, and we had different research projects. And this was the outcome of different projects that we have from the ski course that we made out of bamboo to structural connections that we made out of the BBL, basically, to showcase that. The availability, the uh, applicability of the material is quite unlimited if we have the right design, if we have the right uh, application for it. So, another research that we did, Nazan will explain on the uh, biobased materials that we started also here, but then we continued in Germany. So, hi everyone, my name is Nazan. So basically, um, as Ali mentioned, what we are trying to do is to find alternative material. Yeah. So to find alternative materials for for maybe uh, construction industry without basically putting more force than nature. Mm -hmm. So we, our idea is to be inspired by nature, not to farm it more than what we have already done, and that is why we have the problem of climate change because of our past new ones. So we got inspired by fungi, basically one of the most dominant organisms of our planet, and specifically mycelium. 
which is, if you look closer, is the root network of mushroom, which act as a binder, making us independent of using any synthetic resins for construction industry and also many other industries. So looking into the life cycle of uh, fungi itself, it starts from fruiting body most of the time, not always, and then the fruiting body releases spores into the air, and in the right condition, the spores will germinate and expand uh, under the air or in the woods to develop a huge network of mycelium. And the mycelium network, in the right time, will just develop the fruiting body. So what we see is basically only the under the ground. Uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned, it basically the roots network of mycelium, if we look, we look under the microscope, we will see the network, how it forms. So here the resolution is not so perfect, but it's like a spider net, which penetrates into the substrate and around the substrate, making it together through some chemical reaction, which happens naturally. And it basically, develop a composite. So we have these three particles with the help of mycelium, which grows into it and on, around it, we have a composite at the end, uh, which I hope I had a sample here with me, but it looks like any other material like a normal biological based composite. So the formation of mycelium materials, it fits into the, the context of urban biocycle. That is what our project is about. And if we look into the production cycle, in a mushroom farm, it's not something very sophisticated because it's already what is happening in the farms for decades. It starts from collection of the waste, organic waste most of the time, and then extralizing it to get rid of other microorganisms. And then the mycelium network would form. And there is no limit for growing of the mycelium Basically, the, the limit is the geometry of the shape, because as long as there is food, the mycelium network would expand. And then after the development of mycelium network, we are having protein bodies. And then the, the whole, uh, basically, mycelium can go back to the cycle and it can be decomposed. But what we are interested in is not the protein bodies. So right after the mycelium network is grown, we would stop the growth with heat, and then we have a composite, which at the end of life can be decomposed and go back to the cycle of production. That is how we have like the urban bio cycle, following a circular economy concept. And the, the, the research that we do is what is called global project, meaning that we can use a global concept using regional resources, using local resources. At the time we were in Singapore, we were using a lot of local resources, which is uh, typical to Southeast Asia, like we were using sugar cane, we were using waste from uh, palm oil plantation, and we were using a lot of bamboo waste for our production. And that is what we are also doing now with our partners in Singapore from NTU. So now that we are in Europe, we are using a lot of uh, waste like hemp from uh, corn production and also uh, furniture producers. So we also collect their waste because also waste is based on wood materials. So we can use it for the production of myself. The, the, in general, I like to put some pictures here so we can visualize a, a bit better what we are doing. So, uh, so it starts from pure culture of mycelium. Uh, like any other biotechnological based uh, basic production. And then we develop a liquid mycelium or, or a seed, which later on can be mixed with the substrate and then to develop a fully colonized batch of substrates. The colonized batch of substrates can later be molded into any shape for different applications. So this is just an example for uh, like it can be grown into a lightweight or a dense weight. I will explain in the following slides. So now I would focus on the lightweight material, which can have several range of applications. It can be so like some of the easy applications that you can think of is for packaging industry to replace styrofoam. Another application is for insulation to help us to absorb uh, sound and also uh, for heat conductivity for like heat insulation materials. And this is specific example is a project we did to, to create um, pipes for 
beekeepers, basically. And uh, okay, so I think I can see Okay. I don't know how this is working, but anyway, so this table summarizes the, the basically the properties of the mycelium at, at its light weight. So only focusing on compressive strength and, for example, collectural strength, we can see that uh, the material has properties comparable, even better than, for example, ESP expanded poly polystyrofoam. So uh, that means that we can use this type of materials for the application, as I mentioned, packaging and insulation industry. We have also done some tests with our uh, basically uh, partners of, in our FC Global project in ETH Zurich. So we have run some thermal conductivity tests and which I we have done some thermal conductivity and also some acoustic performances. And these the properties that we gain are similar to what is already in market. So the question is only how the material lasts and what is the durability of the material. We have also performed some experiments on the life cycle of the material itself. And I have some slides which you can see at the end. So besides the light fake uh, material that we have explored, we have also explored. This is the main project that we are focusing at the moment. I think three slides are now collided <laughs> together. Okay, I think that's good. So this is one of the projects that we are focusing the most at the moment. It's called Neowood. It's a dense form of micellar material. We are working with lightweight material as well, but now one of our main focus is to use micellium in its dense form because we can have we can find a wide range of applications for that. It can be a direct replacement to particle board, OSC or NDF. Or climate itself. Now I look outside, I see that we have some nice furnitures here. I think they are made of plywood. If I'm not wrong, I was thinking they could easily be from new wood or from bamboo, which was developed from here. Yeah. It's a little bit disappointing that why we are not using our own locally produced materials in this project, but hopefully for the next round of renovation, then it can be used. So basically, new wood. It's a high performance, hundred percent circular material because we have already we have used waste from furniture production in this case from from hemp, and then we grow it together with mycelium and we heat some pressure, we turn it into a composite which looks like which looks like wood and acts like wood as well. So this is like a picture which puts a, this is like a particle board and then together with. A, or new, so it looks like this. So we can see that they, they look similar. They also feel similar to much. Unfortunately, I don't have a sample But I will also skip this one. It's just trying to compare the lightweight mycelium material and dense mycelium material. And we can see with only densifying the material five times, ten times, how much increase we can make into the strengths. If you're interested, you can just um, see the, the publication. I can share the link with you if you want. So, one of the works that we did together with our partners is uh, sitting here from NTU. Is one of the main questions that we always ask, as I mentioned, about the durability and life cycle of the material. So this diagram shows that, for example, if it starts from the beginning, the time that we grow the substrate that we need to grow mycelium on, all the way to growing the mycelium on the substrate itself. So it starts, for example, in that case, from growing of bamboo all the way to growing the mycelium on top of it, and for for the application that we are interested. So this is specific study is for a short-term use application, probably like two months, but it can also last a lot not longer in the room condition. We have samples from six years ago, they are still looking the same. And after the, the end of life, the material can be composted, which the compost again can be used to grow the fiber. So that, that kind of shows again how circular the whole production of the material is. And the same applies when we are using a little 
bit of long term usage, for example, for furniture or when we need a more durability of the material. So, this is the study is only for one year, but the material itself, we have also done some studies for the new wood. It can have at least a shelf life of up to 10 years, which is enough for uh, furniture production. So, usually the shelf life for furniture is between five to 10 years, according to the furniture producers. Um, so another part of our research, which is really important, especially now, it's always about the life cycle of the material. So we have also done some um, LCA analysis for the material to find out uh, basically about the whole cycle of production, about the amount of carbons that we are producing during the life cycle, and how much water we are using, and uh, what is the fossil fuel energy demand that we are basically, uh, we need to produce the material, mycelial material. So, okay. so we have done one a study to, to compare the, the life cycle of mycelial material producing the lab. So because we don't have a large scale production, so we only focus in the lab and we compare it with uh, biologically based insulation materials and also particle board and OSP bottles. So we, ha we have done the study for different range of densities from lightweight and also to the dense. So only focusing on the lightweight material, we can see that, for example, for production of mycelium material at its lightweight, the amount of CO2 that we are producing per kilogram of the material is about 0.64 kilograms. For wood fiber insulation board, which is still considered a biological based material, we need almost 100 times more. So, this, so why we are having such a significant reduction is because we are using base materials for our production. So, we don't need to use any fresh tea factories. So, there has been a lot of CO2 already absorbed into the material, and we are delaying the returning back of the CO2 to the earth because we are giving another life. So that is the whole purpose of what we are doing. And it's not only in the CO2 production of fossil energy demand, also for the acidification and nitrification of the material, which means how, what are the damages that we are making to our waters. So far we have... So far we have created several proof of concept, proof of value prototypes. So this is one of the prototypes that we did. It's like an artist prototype as part of our another project in Germany. It's called Zukunft Bau. So we produce uh, a panel for opposite purposes with different shapes. One is grown in this one. It's like fully grown in one frame and another one we use tiles. And we also reinforce it with wood to test uh, basically the opposite performance of the material under different circumstances. And the result was promising. So this the application for such walls is for a place like here to help us uh, absorb sound for office spaces. So the test that we also did was for the sound ranges for normal office spaces, not for high for example. Another project that we did is uh, Another project that we did is also part of the Batam House project, which uh, Ali explained earlier about the bamboo. Together with our collaborators, we have also basically developed uh, something like new wood, but not 100% similar to what we are working at the moment, but uh, another version of the new wood to uh, basically as an interior wall panel of the building. So for we use mycelium only for interior applications because the material performs for indoor applications. It's not a hundred percent waterproof material, so we cannot use it to be exposed to to the constant rain and humidity outside. But this was the interior of the building. It's a still. It's not an air conditioned room. It's open space, but it's not exposed to, for example, rain. We have also my for life, we have uh, we have also to 
and some oxygen like a human body fully grown out of mycelium. This is a very small piece that we produced last year. It is it resembles how disease or planet is. So this is part of a, a like a legendary piece. It's called uh, Colporio. So it's like a, the protector of the forest. And it also shows that our forests are sick and we need to take care of them and we need to act fast to help them basically protect them the forest. So Ali would explain the rest and I will come back to you. So I think uh, this part we go a little bit quick. So another thing, uh, research that we do a lot is always a resource efficiency in design. We, as I explained, we use a lot of materials, the amount of CO2 is generated due to extraction of the material. It's very, very interesting. As you can see, most of the CO2 comes during the extraction of the materials. So the question here is that how we can reduce the amount of that we use in the construction industry because in the species, most of the materials that they design, percent of the extraction goes to construction. But the question is that how we can plan. The only way to do so, of course, would be through learning from the nature to basically uh, biomimetic and parametric design, where basically we design for efficiency. We design the structure based on the load that is being basically carried away by it. If you look at how the trees are growing, normally trees, they have very thick branches and then they have lots of nice branches coming up to resist the wind load, to resist the uh, different type of basically environmental conditions. But the question is that, how can we apply it to the structure? Of course, is a still very, very new things in design. So you don't see that the moment in uh, every scale of the buildings, mostly in a special construction, you will see that in some exhibitions, some expos, or some special buildings, you see the application of biomimetic, but we try to use it in some of our uh, projects that we did uh, with our partners, uh, also together with FSCO in between 2013 to 2018. This was the waste pavilion. So here again, the idea was to develop uh, basically non-permanent space for architectural talks or exhibitions together with our, uh, I think it was Swiss, uh, Swiss Next in New York. Uh, we collaborated with a US-based company that uses only uh, based uh, especially for this project, we designed the wall load the base of the and I'm able to know that we do the home still only wood as you can see in the next pictures. So you can see and the as a column base we use only the uh, pallets and as the roof you can see we only use elements of central packs and to that every design capacity is special to do and so on. We can only use basically the base material. At the same time, we use the parametric design to design the structure of the roof that the, everything is stayed in compression. So there was no screws, there was no even glues. So the idea was that at the end of this exhibition, as you can see, people there were this exhibition in New York for movies. And then after that, they could easily dismantle everything and move it around in different uh, see, another project that we did again, uh, micro tree, we did it uh, together with the ETH. You want to go in quickly? This is the, our famous micro project that, that is the time that we uh, joined uh, CFL to, to basically conduct this project. A strong element and is that probably is a great uh, this uh, structure in micro tree all the slight weight elements which are under pressure under loads they are mycelium and the, the roof itself is from bamboo composite and the whole this whole structure was weighing around seven eight hundred uh, almost one ton so the these three columns at the bottom they are carrying each of them about two to three hundred gram of weights. Uh, so the designer that I mentioned was like a three, based on 3D graphic set, uh, static, was like a, a parametric design, and we digitally fabricate each individual mold specifically designed for, for this purpose, and then we, uh, we make individual elements, 
So we digitally fabricated the loom, we grew the mycelium inside, and then we uh, basically uh, assembled everything together like the label. So I like you see the so I think I think most of you already because working at FC like you are very familiar with the circular construct or circularity, circular economy. So I don't go to the detail, but for us it's important to uh, have the materials in the circle as long as possible. So the type of materials we use in construction, we hope to be able after the end of the life, they are not end of the life, but we can reuse it in the circle. Circular this was a project, first project that we did together with Professor Stephen Cairns at FCM2. That the idea was that this was a model house. We, want, we wanted to do it in Batam in Indonesia because we didn't get the building permit in Singapore. So we had this land, land near Air New Airport in uh, Indonesia, in the Batam island just here. And the idea was that to use some of the materials that we developed in the research at FCM. And the design, the urbanization, everything was also done here with, our, with the team from FCL. As you can see here, the idea was to have sustainable township in Indonesia. So this was just a small example. But what was interesting for our team was that to be able to fabricate all the elements, prefabricate all the elements based on the design that we have in the in the in house, basically. Of course, in the larger scale, it would be done at the prefabricated uh, construction lab or prefabricated uh, factory. But here we had a lab here, we had the CNC at the FCL. So we produce all the bamboo composite elements, we produce all the mycelium box composite elements we did. Uh, cut them according to the sizes and everything that the structural engineers advised us, and then we brought them basically on site. Every uh, story of the building was added gradually, basically every done with the non-trained technicians or workers. So the idea was that we can replicate this model in future, that we don't need cranes, we don't need huge uh, infrastructure for housing or for constructing those type of local low-rise houses, especially for Indonesia. At the same time, 90% of the material used in this project was from sustainable source. And based on the study that we did together with Professor Kings, we managed to achieve net zero within the building because the house is also uh, basically uh, used the energy is based on the renewable resources, solar panels. And this is some pictures that were we used BBL within the house. Another project, also similarly, it was Umar in Zurich, in Dubendo, at a part of EMPA. Here, the idea was that how we can modularize every story of the house. So what we did in this project, we were responsible for one story. So we worked with Werner Sofa Architecture in Germany, and together with our team, and also with Nest uh, Building at EMPA. If you can get Nest, you will see this is a building, a research building that is designed and built to be a lot of research that we carried out at ETH. So one module basically we designed, the second story of the house was modularized elements. So every module was prefabricated outside using only recycled wood, recycled material. So we didn't use anything new. So we use the wood waste, we use from the old buildings that being uh, torn down. We use also the, the steel from the old buildings that basically were torn down. The, uh, basically the framings for the windows, for the door, everything. So not, I, would, I don't say 100%, but 95% were from recycled materials and the modules were come on site and then put in within two days. And this is also, we also managed to use some of our materials, some of our uh, BVL for furniture, for flooring, for, uh, and also we also managed to use our mycelium for insulation. And part of our work, of course, the BBL part went to commercialization. Basically, after 2019, NRF research funding on the BBL on the bamboo stuff. So we had to find uh, an idea what we want to do with it. So there was also interest from FCL during that time. Our managing director said, why don't you start uh, to talk to companies about commercialization? And then we licensed the technology from ETH and NUS. And then we started with those as a sort of a spin-off of the basic BFCL. 
I think it was, it's only a startup company out of FCL in the past uh, seven, eight years that I'm aware of that. And the business model is based on a very B2B business model. Our IP, our patent also was granted almost globally. So at the moment, the company is in the fundraising estate, working with uh, different companies in Singapore, in Germany, and also in Cambodia and Argentina. And the idea is that we can scale up this production, localize it. So in each different region that we have bamboo, we can have uh, microsite for production, and then that we can help to globally expand the reach of BBL, which already the company has uh, won quite many awards, and that's quite a very good result, I would say, for the company, the very earliest safe company out of uh, FCL. And some of the awards that we won, I mean, one of the very most interesting or very important awards that we won as part of our research was for our new food that we won the German Sustainable Building Council Award in 2020. Uh, two, this is very rare that they give to material the startup, not the startup, the new good project that we did at KIT. But this was very interesting for us because they showcased that how Europe or how Germany value a bio based material or sustainable uh, materials. Just to finalize, these are the main pillars of our research. If you are interested to work with us or you have ideas in any of these pillars, we are always happy to collaborate in Singapore or in Germany. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions here, then happy to discuss or to answer. So I have a question about the, uh, the BBL material and particularly the way that it is. Uh, I mean, since uh, since I start, uh, you started by explaining that there's a need to that there are uh, considerations of lifespan and uh, how it responds to let's say weather and things like that in in uh, untreated or, or standard just uh, bamboo as a natural material. And so that's that's where this this whole effort comes from to try and to try and make it somewhere competitive with uh, with other materials like concrete or industrial materials. So. Um, how, so so um, when and when you when you develop this the, the BBL, you then compared it to things like concrete and steel. But how does it actually compare with uh, with let's say the equivalent in stock of uh, natural bamboo in an instance, for example, like the like bamboo uses reinforcement for concrete. So if I if I were to use uh, BBL as reinforcement for concrete versus if I were to use uh, let's say split bamboo. Um, yeah, we have done a lot of uh, studies on that. So first of all, using natural bamboo in concrete has major issues because of durability. So it doesn't last long. So that means that after a while, if there is a humidity or water penetration in concrete, bamboo spans or basically becomes, I mean, your normal timber product that you buy, if water gets in, it starts to expand. Bamboo is the same, especially in natural form. Once expands in the concrete cracks, and that's that's why use of natural bamboo in concrete is not uh, advisable anymore, especially for housing. But if for let's say for shelters, those that you house people for maybe six months, eight months, ten months, that's fine. But if you talk about a bit more modern construction, natural bamboo, based on our studies and many studies available, literature is very strong on that, is not advisable. That's why we have to find a solution that make it modernized or make it industrialized. Because if you want to compete with concrete, and even if you want to compete with timber, the natural bamboo is not industrialized very well. But once you transform it into PBL, it can be any shape, any form, any form. You can cut it like food. So that's why then people or industry gets the interest to come in and to use it. So it's easier to work with it in general. I hope I have answered your question. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really great. Um, my question is for Nazanin um, regarding the lightweight uh, isolate box. Um, how, like what, like uh, we saw that large scale production in terms of the tree, the micro tree. But in terms of like practically replacing the styrofoam materials, what like what is the timeline you see as having like on the experience of like being an expert and how can we have that? So basically now there are some there are there is uh, one company in the US that is producing in 
mycelium materials for applications like packaging in the larger scale, uh, but but they are not fully uh, basically functional at the moment. But at the end, it's a very possible thing because we are already doing mushroom farming for decades, for ages. And mushroom farming, every day they can produce 6,000, 7,000 tons of material day in a farm. And mycelium is nothing more complicated than what is already happening in farms, in primitive farms. Not doesn't necessarily need to be a modern farm. Even in primitive farms, they are capable of producing huge amount of mycelium materials on a daily basis. Of course, the mycelium takes two, two, two weeks, three weeks to grow, but they can have like a continuous cycle of production. So in terms of uh, feasibility to produce mycelium materials in larger scale, it's definitely possible because people have been doing similar things um, in mushroom production. So it's not really a problem, but it's just a matter of um, socially accepting the concept of using some this type of materials using um, using mushrooms for uh, for like in our cities in, in the context of urban. Well, that actually brings me to my second question. So I was like, I was wondering, like, the minute you hear words like fungus and spores, like you know, for customers, I can't try to try to convince like someone in my family to who's doing the renovation to sort of make it. Sure. Or oh, have you like what is the inertia there? And can you talk to us about how we can. Okay. Sure. Actually, this is uh, it's more like educating people to understand what is the difference between having mushroom in your house and having myself. Because the moment we are worried about the spores is because of the mushroom polluting bodies. They are producing the spores. So my sodium is the initial state. And because we are stopping the growth of my cellium prior to the stage that it goes to the fruiting body. We don't have any problems with the spores. So the material is not alive anymore. It does not continue growing. It does not produce the spores. So it's basically like a glue. And imagine, too, it's like a very, one of the first applications that I can think of is in our kindergartens. Because now kids are exposed to material. And most of the material, they are made from plastics. My friends, which have kids, they, they can totally understand it. And like the kids are touching it, they are inhaling the basically the, the VOC which comes from these materials. But nobody questions it, right? Because we are so much used to having these materials around us that it doesn't even come to my or mind that are is it safe for the kids to be in contact with or the playgrounds, the plastics, the plastics that like on the slides the kids comes down is all plastics and they have. Hugging materials, but of course they are in the same level. Of course, they, they have also been tested. But mycelium is completely uh, organic. It's just the food waste, and it's grown with mushrooms, which is also edible. But and it does not generate a spores, so it does not have also allergy. Hazards. So it's, I think it's educating people is is helping to to basically overcome this. Uh, Sphere the society to use mushrooms in cities. Yeah, I would like to thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you for organizing this. It was nice to be here again after some time. And if you have any questions or interest in working with us, just drop us an email. Yeah. <laughs>